Now, just so you know what you're in for this afternoon, as facilitator of these workshops with Domestic Workers United, I'm going to say just a few short words about the project, its history and precursors, including a brief video from a similar workshop that I conducted at Ford <coughs> Auto Factories in the US and South Africa. From there, we'll transition to a 10-minute documentary film made by Olga Oros, who followed us through each and every one of our workshops for the past five months. After the video, the poets of Domestic Workers United, seated to my left, will come and share some of their writings with us, and we'll close the event with a conversation and Q&A with you, our audience. A decade ago, after leading a workers' organization that helped unionize one of only two unionized borders bookstores in the country, I started looking for ways to bring the stories and voices of workers more fully into the realm of literature. In addition to writing about American and transnational working class in my books Shut Up, Shut Down on the Deindustrialization of the U.S. Rust Belt and Coal Mountain Elementary, on a series of mine disasters in the US and China, I started facilitating my first union workshops in Chicago in 2004. And I recently found out, actually, that one of the first poems published by a man in that workshop named Frank Cunningham, a member of the IBEW, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, uh, won a poetry contest and was published in the Saturday Evening Post. Several years later, in 2006, the Ford Motor Company made an announcement that it would be closing between 14 and 16 of their factories in the US and Canada, and that more than 30,000 workers in those plants would be losing their jobs. And so I decided to ask uh, the UAW at a plant that was a half mile from my office and then in St. Paul, Minnesota, and was closing, if I could start teaching a creative writing workshop inside the Ford plant in between shifts. And to my astonishment, uh, they said yes. Mm -hmm. And so every week or two, we would meet at the factory in between shifts, and workers from the plant, many who had worked there for 10 or 20 or 30 years, sometimes they had a spouse or a child working in the plant as well, would get together and read their poems. And so I just want to share one of those pieces with you today. Uh, after doing these 
workshops for a series of months, I started writing to the other Ford plants that were closing, uh, asking if I could teach similar workshops in them. And uh, every single one, I never heard a response. But a few months after that, I got a grant to be able to go to South Africa to do some readings at colleges and universities there. And I thought, well, I wonder if there are Ford plants in South Africa. And I went to Google, as we do, and found out that there were two, one in Port Elizabeth uh, at the southern tip of the country, one in Pretoria, the capital. And then I said, well, who's the union? And it turned out to be NUMSA, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa. Sent them a quick email uh, after having not heard back all of these emails from the other four plants. And 48 hours later, I got an email back which was a two-page long itinerary of my creative writing workshop. They would be eight hours long a piece in each factory. They would be two days long. Uh, and was I a vegetarian for the catered lunch? Uh, so it gave me a sense, really, of the kind of interest, particularly outside of the United States at this point in time, in these poetry workshops. So in a sense, what I was trying to do is find a way in which workers in two different countries, in these four plants in the US and uh, in South Africa, could talk to each other through poetry. And so I took this video that you just saw, and I played it for the workers in South Africa. And this is one of the poems that was produced. long, so I was trying to figure out what do I do in a 16-hour poetry <laughs> workshop. Uh, and so really what we did is we divided up the days, um, one into the first person singular, the kind of I poem, and the second day into the first person plural, like what could we produce as a poem, as a group. And this is, uh, this is what we came up with. It's their poem called, uh, Oh, What a Life. We are the noise of folk motor company of South Africa. This is our way all by life. To get a life of sin, we have to climb a little mountain, cross the river Nile at Galahad Desert, and talk the language of the angels. All oh, by life. We are getting wages that can only take us to and from back to do the production. All oh, by life. We cannot pay our money services and fees for the future of our children. Oh my life! Loan sharks keep our bank cards because we live on loans. Oh my life! For managers to get training, it takes a phone call. For workers to get training, we take to the street. Oh my life! Managers are driving fancy cars. Ours can't even afford to buy and own one. Oh my life! Oh, what a life! Oh, what a life! Since uh, 2000, these 2006 uh, Ford workshops, I've facilitated similar workshops with a number of groups. Uh, one with a group of formerly striking clerical workers at the University of Minnesota through Ask Me 3800. Another with a group of young uh, Somali and Muslim healthcare workers and nurses uh, through an organization called Rufeda. But as I say uh, every Saturday when we meet, 
there's really no place in the world that I'd rather be than doing a workshop with uh, the poets of Domestic Workers United. Uh, there on their ninth floor offices on Broadway. We meet, we talk, uh, we do a lot of talking. Uh, we share stories and write poems. Uh, and now, thanks to the dedication of filmmaker Olga Oros, let's take a brief peek inside what really happens during those Saturday workshops.
read it, we'll read the, uh, if someone can read the Spanish on the left or the English on the right, and we'll, we'll use that. And what would happen if we simply crossed out the word tobacco and put domestic? And then what would we need? So we already started thinking about that as we read through the channel. So if someone can read in Spanish. En su poema había hígado y corazones. Su poema era un tratado de economía popular. There was no pain. There were no acts of bodies. No relations of the labor around. What sense do you get of the poem? What, what feeling from the poem do you get? What kind of woman is she talking about? I think it's the woman that she had a chorus. Let me feel that she was a woman that she wants to fight. I saw Martin Luther King in it, whereas she was spoken in the sea there. What Martin Luther King said about domestic workers, we should lift our head high when we walk into any room and understand that what we are doing is not degradable. We hold a whole population, a next generation in our hands, and yet still, we can't understand that. I see a sister soul in here. Yes. She's had research something that's greater in this tobacco plant. Mm -hmm. How much we can strive for if we're together? How many thoughts that people have or, or lines or phrases or anything that sets out as we were reading it? So there was no begging, there was no acts of violence, no violations of labor laws. So I, mean, I wish we could say that as domestic workers, you know, we're constantly begging right. on the job for everything. I just want to comment on what I did is your feelings. Writing is your thoughts, is what you have in you and your mind, and you know. Thank you, thank you. Let's slide down this way because there's some like bumper cars happening We're still, you know, who knew that poetry is so popular we're going to get a bigger table? <laughs> so, uh, whatever we bring to the table, it's our own mind and heart and creativity that's coming out and we all honor that. All right, now in the 15 minutes or however long ago we have left, what I'd like you to do is on a sheet of paper, take that first line of hers, change the word tobacco to domestic, and then tell that story. Nasty, ugly, dirty. We look like no humans. They see how we look from outside, not from inside. A domestic woman. So strong, resilient, powerful. Women are strong. Not even knowing their strength and what they are capable of doing. Long discriminated against. No laws to stand by, but still standing tall. What audacious thing. Who can say we are not strong? You? You? I'm working as a big sitter night and day. Something hit me. I am working my butt out with pains going through all my body. What if I quit? Who would help me feed my family? Wow, I woke up. Shake a leg. Get it together. We are different, but not divided. So raise your head high. Stand tall. It is up to you to make this sport. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, you know, now, the goal for our next meeting is to work on whatever we started. And if you have time, right, and I know it's hard to come by, bring something next week that you can share with others. And then you'll also have my email. So if you're typing or something, you're working on it, and you want to send it to me, I love coming here on Saturday. We love you too. <laughs> You know, as I was thinking about this exercise, I remember that session in which we were moving the table. We were so full of people. The entire room was full, and people were saying, you know, where they had come from, mm -hmm. and it was really all around the world. And 
And so I saw on the wall here this solidarity and building solidarity, and there's really nothing that quite does that in poetry like a group piece that we all do together. This is basically the structure that your four-line poem will take in wherever it is, something you did, something you saw, something you experienced that feels to you really specific to where you were born and where you came from. And then here in America, something that's different from that, that contrasts that in a different way. And one person would say their line, and then everybody would say the chorus line. Then the next person would say their little poem, and then everybody would say the chorus line. You want to work on it, edit it a little bit. And then when you're done with that, try thinking about this common line we could use. And it might not be the permanent one, but we can at least test it out today. Yeah, I'm excited to see how this will flow yeah. bigger group. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's try it out one time. Let's just keep going. This is not going to be the permanent order. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah. okay? Everybody in? Yes. That's it. They say, oh, let's go. Ready, guys? And now the real stars of our film. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our first reader, Yvonne Innes. This is a story about two dogs, Gladstone and Neville. It is my fable, one of my fables. There was once a dog named Gladstone that lived in a very posh environment. And there was this dog, Neville, who lived in the neighborhood. He had to scavenge for his existence. Neville would pass the house where Gladstone lived and longed for such lavish lifestyle. However, Gladstone would only bark at him and chase him away. Neville told Gladstone, Glad, sorry, Gladstone that his lifestyle could change and he would be just as him roaming and scavenging through the garbage one of these days. Gladstone's owner suffered a stroke and was placed in a nursing home eventually. The only son he had did not like animals so he did not give Gladstone the attention he needed. One day, Gladstone, feeling hungry, saw Neville passing by. Gladstone got out of the house and ran off with Neville. Now, Gladstone had his freedom to roam. He was now able to get a full belly roaming through garbage bins and food wherever he went with Neville. They became best friends. <laughs> All right, this is on my two line point. Why is my black hair kinky and not straight? Are we that different from each other with the same color blood in our veins? Why are some people always happy and others have sad continents? Do we care enough for each other to look beyond the superficial? From where came the origin of what we call life and living? This one is, um, home is like this. Crying roosters, cooing pigeons, bring you out of the night's slumber. The smell of boiling chocolate or coffee permeating the atmosphere, served in enamel mugs. Who can resist fried dumplings with ackee and saltfish for breakfast? Neighbors greeting each other. Morning, Miss Jane. 
How are you this morning? Mr. Bob was up early sweeping his yard. Little children rushed out to gather mangoes that fell during the night from the trees. Parents getting children ready for school. Mothers combing their daughters' hair and putting bows at Platt's end. Well dressed in well ironed khaki pants and the navy blue pleated skirts, their school uniforms. Hurry up, it's getting late, was always heard. Uh, our next reader to my immediate left, uh, Griselda Sanchez. Hi um, to everyone. Forgive me because my third language is not English. <laughs> A domestic worker united wrote the poem to the organization. I saw many of us fighting to each other, trying to minimize us. I don't know why. Because here I fighting for the better treatment and respect for all of us. And I think they too. Our fighting should be against the people who exploiting us, abusing us, or that people that are looking personal interest. I'm very happy when I see my sister asking for training to get knowledge to develop better our organization and improve our everyday life. I don't like when my sister are treated like ignorance. We should take off our blinds and see what is happening. <laughs> the crocodile and the little bird. Mr. Crocodile is swimming in a huge lake eating fish and playing in the, in the water happily. But so suddenly a lot of mosquitoes came and bothered him. As a little bird came along and landed on top of him and ate all the mosquitoes, Mr. Crocodile saw and thought that the little bird might be so good and fat now that he wanted to eat the bird. But the bird read his thoughts and told the crocodile if you eat me today, tomorrow more, more, more mosquitoes will come to you and, and bother you again, and I won't be here to help you out. Two hands are better than one. And also this happening in daily basis between us. When, see peop when we see people succeed, we try to rip them apart instead of helping them. Next, at the far end of the table, Lizette Valencia. Um, good afternoon. My thoughts about feeling that we are from another country. Uh, even if I'm far or ways, I will have you, you deeply inside me. Thanks God for everything. Give the opportunity to have more from deeply yourself of us, I say. So I love, look ahead to thankful, try to convince ourselves to follow the coming out of our heart from other country, far to, to try to erase the tears of our mother or lovely. How I miss our people, the honest of my people. And between so my thing you remember? That moment's happy days where the table fall in different tastes. Of the smile of mothers. The generosity I'm sorry. The generosity hang up low. Thank you. So this poem is called The Price of Migration Equals Slave Labor. And it's a certain style of poem that I alluded to. I think it's a, I don't know if it's a rondelay or a pantu. However, cotton picking days ain't over. Madam List grow, glow, and grow. Lighthouse keeping, walk dog, let baby be first priority. Madam Liss grow, glow, grow. Island woman, warm spirit, vex. 
Let baby be first priority. U.S. dollar controls Manhattan East. Island woman warm spirit vex. Scoop shit from shitty sidewalk. U.S. dollar controls Manhattan East. Unlike Tobago's tobacco sunny soil. Scoop shit from shitty sidewalk. Times classify ad never spell this. Unlike tobacco's Tobago's tobacco sunny soil. Work never been this hard. Times classify ad never spell this. Price of migration means yes ma'am. Work never been this hard. Baby, unrelated burden pushed along Avenue Dank. Price of migration means yes ma'am. Light housekeeping, walk dog, baby, unrelated burden pushed along Dank Avenue. Cotton picking days ain't over. Mm. Mm. Um, this next piece of, um, well, it's not my work. It's a work in progress. I hate to say it's a work in progress. But it's not my work in so much as it's a list that one of my sister friends went on an interview late last year. And I found it to be, listen, poetry is charged language and it's very interesting, it's very complex. And this is the interview list that she got in 2011, just before summer. And I will add my two cents. My two cents to this poem is that the four children didn't even mention yet. So I want you to conjure up in your mind this list, and this list is factual. And um, so members of domestic workers decided to make a play, to do a play out of this list. But it's real. So the poem is 20, the interview, and I call it the list. Each week, beds are to be made and blinds in the bedroom opened each morning. Each evening, blinds in the bedrooms are to be closed. And my two cents is... And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. Before you go down for the night, please be sure the kitchen and eating areas are cleaned, dishes cleaned, and kitchen floor mopped. The bathrooms should be cleaned three times a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. My two cents again. And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. Sheets on all upstairs bedrooms should be changed and washed one time a week unless otherwise needed sooner. If they are, if they are a guest on a weekend, on Mondays, the room they, are, they were in should be cleaned and sheets washed. Shower towels and hand towels should be changed and washed two times per week. My two cents again. And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. But wait a minute. This point could be interactive, you know. You could help me after every two lines, or you could say two. And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. Let us go again. Say it with me. And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. Okay, I will give all you the cue. The rooms should be fully dusted and vacuumed one to two times a week. I never thought of the baseboard, but the baseboard also has to be cleaned. Around the lights and the ceiling moldings and under the beds and in the corners. Ceiling fans in the bedroom should be cleaned once a week or more if you notice that they are dusty. And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. Hello somebody. The kitchen should be kept clean, but one to two times a week should be thoroughly cleansed. The oven should be cleaned once a week and the stove tap as needed. The fridge upstairs and downstairs should be cleaned out once a week. Rotten food thrown out and shelves and drawers wiped out. And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. 
Before the end of the week, all the laundry should be done and left in the bedrooms before you leave for the weekend or before the anticipated day off. Anything else around the house that you notice needs straightening or cleaning, please take it upon yourself to do it. And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. Put a little sass in it. And the four children ain't even mentioned yet. By the way, this is for four hundred dollars living position. Aha. Uh -huh. And I'll do my and uh, we alluded to the Aesop fable, so I will go with the Aguti and the Ant. And for you those of you who don't know about the Aguti, the Aguti is a very tropical um, reptile. It's it's also a savory dish. People hunt it, hunt for you know, as a form of food. So this is my little Aesop fable. We alluded to the Aesop fable, so I'll just make a little slant. Once an aguti was on the prowl, trying to terrorize and destroy every ant he saw. By the way, the aguti was fair game for the villagers who hunted aguti for food. Suddenly the queen ant, she was terrified. And she said to the aguti, if you would just for once stop bothering us, perhaps one day we would be able to return a favor. Mind you, it was the Easter weekend. And the human folks were hunting for a goatee left, right, and center in the forest. And you know what? That Sunday meal would have been something delectable and special. So they came with their pellet guns and slingshots. And when the ants saw the injustices, they built a burrow with leaves and twigs. And they said to the Aguti, we would cover you. We would cover you this time. And you know something about the ant? They are really the most minute creature, but very hardworking. So when the hunters pounced on the Aguti, the aunt was able, the queen aunt was able to usher the aguti in the burrow and camouflage. Her. So the moral of the story is that you never know who is gonna come along on your life journey, who just might become your savior. Our next reader is Arlene Charles. Hi, I'm Arlene. This is my Hi, I'm Arlene. This is my Aesop um, fable with a twist. There once was a pumpek, there once was a pit bull who complained about everything and nothing. He had to take care of his wife, who was very ill. He was told of a pumpek who was very kind and her perfection was looking after the sick. The pit bull whined about sleepless nights and agreed to Mrs. Pompek waking for him. But when the Pompek began to wake, the pit, the pit bull sleep, sweet sleep, when the pit bull, when the Pompek began to wake for the pit bull, sweet sleep returned. He was so happy. But yes, the same pit bull who was complaining about hell, he was now he was complaining about hell before the, pit, but the pump egg started to wake. Was now refusing to allow the pump egg to sleep while his wife, Mrs. Pitbull, was asleep. Forgetting Mrs. Pump egg needed her sleep as well. Oh, how he was contradicting himself. My Christian poem. Look not at my dark skin. There is so much more to me. My heart cries out for peace. And justice for the poor. When with love and selfishness prevail, 
when will love and selfishness prevail? My heart cries out for peace for the poor. When will love and when will love prevail over selfishness? Is there hope? Does love and hate live in the same house? Everything is vanity without love. Thank you, Arlene. Um, our next reader is Jeanette Warner. Hello, I'm Jeanette. My poem is about Antigua. A is for Antigua, we come from Africa. N is for our nation, proud and free. T is for our tomorrow's children. I is for our incredible, warm, sandy, white beaches. G is for our glorious, delicious dishes like pepper pot, ducana, and fungi. A is U is for unity of the natives. A is for Antigua. Let me see your hand. Black, beautiful, proud Afro Antiguans. Julian. A domestic worker wrote, I have had enough. Enough of the long hours and the low pay. Enough of the sick children with snot running down their faces and mom still wanting them to play. Enough of the, I'll be home late, make us dinner, or I'm just going to run into the shower. Stay late. I hope it's not a problem. The 1960s. Today is the same. Laws not made. Still so many broken. Changing it started with a few. Now growing to masses. Worker needing rights. Fair wages. So much done. So much more to do. Yesterday passed. Today. Present. Tomorrow. Change is still coming. As we open the door, come in, come in some more. My question poem. Sunshine, why does my heart miss a beat? Sky blue, who promised you tomorrow? Sparrows sup hum, why is the sound so sweet? Smile sweet. Who comforts you in sorrow? Somewhere, someplace, somehow, who is going to fix it now? Now, um, before we go to the conversation and the Q&A, we have one uh, final thing to share with you. Uh, you know, we're a couple months, I think, into the workshop, and I brought my computer in, and I showed that choral poem that we saw from South Africa. So um, we put a little piece together for you as well. So we need everybody over here. Is this my guy? We are the members of Domestic Workers United, and this is our poem, they say. In Jamaica, I appreciated what Mother Nature provided at the arm's length. Everything was fresh and natural. I had so many good role models to emulate who were creative, making something with the little they had. What in America? I feel restricted in my movement as a living nanny. I feel marginal, marginalized doing million jobs that have become routine. 
I am here, but not here. The rampant racism talks at my core as I am followed around when I shop. They say, say, you are part of the family. family. In Peru, the nanny, housekeeper, or laundry lady are treated there as a part of the, fa of the family member. Here in America, the same people are treated as a girl. You pick it up today and throw it away tomorrow. Mm -hmm. they, they say, you are part of the family. the family. In Guatemala, if we are very poor, we work very hard to give our children slow food, even rice, beans, and tortilla. Or even if there are six or more children, we never deny food. On here, we say most of them, they don't know the meaning to be a mother. That's why they don't know how to treat domestic workers as a human being. Mm. They, they say you are part of the family. Folks, hibiscus, birds of paradise, capricorns. Colorful as carnival, exist on an island rich, pregnant with black gold oil asphalt. Its air rich and you walk up blue. Roti. Folks merry laugh. Gyrates to Trinidad is my land, and of it I am proud, proud and glad. In America, 1990. Women colorful as the island, balance pale babies, laundry, Victoria's Secret, Victoria's Secret, and more Victoria's Secret, <laughs> groceries, interviews, anxious mothers in opulence, all the shadows on each side, Yankee dollar mere pittance, could barely afford Pepe's plane ticket from Border Spain. They say, they say we are part of the family. family. In Trinidad, I am a mother, auntie, and friend to both. Mm -hmm. When it rains, you call in sick. You call, when it rains, you say there's a flood on the main road. Mm -hmm. But in America, I am somebody's babysitter, housekeeper, and nanny, and go by my first name to the children. They, they, say, say, they say you, you are, are part of the family. family. In Barbados, the beach, the ocean, breeze, freedom of island life. In America, life is a nanny, boo-boos, snotty noses, and fevers. Someone else's child is my charge, nurturing, protective, loving. They say you are part of the family. They say you are part of the family. We say, is this how you treat your family? Because the events are being recorded for Penn and will be put up on the Penn website, we ask people uh, who have questions to please come up to the two microphones so that everybody can hear you and that uh, the event can be fully recorded. So as people kind of slowly make their way up who have questions, I, um, I think that uh, I'll just start with one or two to kind of get the conversation going, but please come up to the microphones with your questions. Um, and one of the questions I thought would be a good one to kind of start with, and whoever uh, and the panel wants to kind of pick it up. Um, is that, you know, we, we imagine uh, now and we know much more about, uh, you know, the work that you do each and every day. And so when the word comes that, why don't you come in on a Saturday to do a creative writing workshop on top of it? Uh, it seems like a, an incredible uh, thing to sort of say, well, yeah, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna do it. So I want to know a little bit, maybe from a few people, what was it that drew you in to say, yes, I want to be part of this creative writing workshop? I was so excited because we had the opportunity to say all our feelings as a domestic worker. Because I always say, I don't understand. 
Why think the domestic workers we are humans? We are humans. We were born from a woman, from a mother. Thank you. For me, we are educated women. Back in um, from the islands that we are from, we had a jobs, we had a life. And not because we are here taking care of um, people's children or their elderly um, parents. It doesn't mean that we we do not ha we are not human beings, mm -hmm. right? And some people treat us as if we are not deserving of respect. We are not uh, just like they are. You know, and um, when this creative writing uh, came up, I, I, I embraced it. I, I just say that I had things to say, and I would like to say what, uh, what is in my, my heart. So I just um, decided, in spite of the fact that um, you were these long hours, and um, you would like yes, a Saturday for yourself or to do something else, I think this was very, very, um, very good to do. And so this is what I did. Yes, and for me, it's, it's, it's very cathartic in that as somebody who writes and haven't been writing for the longest, it's a way to, you know, generate more work. Apart from that, too, as domestic workers, we have a lot to say. You get that? We have a lot to say. The relationship with employer versus employee in informal working conditions women harbor they bear they carry they carry the story of the family they work for they carry the family who they they have to literally take care of here in brooklyn they carry the stories of their family where they come from isn't that a lot to say yeah. it's a lot to say it's a lot to carry a lot of women are working in, a lot of women are stressed, a lot of women don't have time off. So when this writing workshop came, ar came around, it was pretty li liberating to everyone who took part because we have a lot to say. And again, my two cents and some more. Part two coming. <laughs> so like I said in the piece, this was Therapy 101. Mm -hmm. And there's no question about it. Our hours are long. Our job is really stressful and demanding. And this was really a place for us to let our hair down and share in the sisterhood of knowing that we all share what our daily lives look like. But we also can give so much to each other and lend that support in a creative way. So this really has been that space for us to open up and share with each other and to share with you. I come from Peru where most of the domestic workers, uh, all the workers in general, they have unions. And I came to America and find out that we don't have rights. Mm -hmm. I was amazed and I said, oh no, this has to change. And I found that now Domestic Worker United. So, and then through Domestic Worker United, I met, I met him. So it was really nice because I can express all my feelings about my background, about the union, about the place that I worked there, and how we were treated as a worker. So, and for me it was really helpful to write it and put it in a piece of paper. Uh, he really helped me a lot doing that. <laughs> Hi. Um, actually, I heard about the workshop. I did not want to get involved because I thought I had nothing to see. <laughs> But um, the last uh, three weeks, Mark encouraged me to come. On the fourth week, I was at the domestic office when they were closing up, and he encouraged me to come. And I said, well, I don't really have anything. I don't know how to write. And it was amazing when I you know, got in this space, and I started to write. I mean, I didn't even know that it would make me cry when I'm reading it now. <laughs> because I mean, saying it now out loud and hearing myself, I mean, I realize that there's pain, and I think it's therapy, good therapy. So, this is it. Mm -hmm. 
For me, I'm glad that we are expressing our feelings because like the rest of the women say, we work and we work very hard and we're not treated right and um, we're human beings. So we just want people out there to know, to respect us because you leave your loved ones, your children in our care and you go to work. If you didn't trust us, you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So we need to be much more respected and a little more pay. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to add that, you know, Arlene probably told like three or four really great stories in a row. And then I said, you know, I think you should probably be in this workshop. So that was, that was the true background to that story. Uh, you know, I get to hang out with these phenomenal women all the time, so I can ask my questions at any point. But this is your one opportunity to do so. So if anyone would like to uh, ask a question, come up to the microphone. We are, we are more than happy to entertain those questions. different context than the ones that you write about. So I'm wondering, have you ever felt any contact and, and with the people you work for? Have you ever felt known in this way by those people? Has that ever happened for you? I must say yes. This person you see sitting at the table here is the person who you see in the home. It's, it's not changed. It's where, where it's a complex relationship. Yes, it's 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 not family. It's it's work relationship. But yes, we have a dynamic camaraderie. Listen, I write, I speak, I sing, I jump, I dance, and this is who they come to know. It, it's no pretense, no contentiousness. So, yes. And if I can answer that question, uh, for me, I think I would say no. My answer would be no. Um, at work, I'm a professional. I'm the nanny. And in my free time, I'm Allison, the activist, the organizer, the writer, the everything else. And there's it's a comparison. Um, and also, there's a difference, you know, just keeping work, work, and keeping every after work just that. And there's no particular reason attached. That's just the way I prefer handle my business. Uh, I do the same as Alison because some people you know just try to take advantage if you do a close communication and I if you became like friend you know sometimes they ask questions just to go and make fun or gas with the friends about the nanny or the housekeepers so I always just focus on my job you know things what it is I'm a nanny housekeeper and a caregiver so Whatever I'm doing, I always focus on what I'm doing because I know I didn't see it, so I have that experience. They don't care about us. Even. Thank you. For me, I keep them separate because what I find, the more people know about you, the more they use it against you. And uh, you can hardly get time to go to the doctor. Much less to mention that, um, you know, once they know that you are so involved in other things, if you ask for a little time, it's going to be um, students are going to be taken as, uh, as if you want to do your take away from their work. So, no. Work is work. My social life and whatever else I need to do, that is um, my thing that I go on a weekend. I'm Griselda here and I'm Griselda at work. I'm playful. I like to play with at work. I really make jokes with my, with my boss and I also I keep my private life apart. But I'm going to say that they went everywhere. Anyway, I'm very athletic, so always doing something around everywhere. Going downtown, I kayak in the house, so <laughs> I do many stuff, but I like to be outgoing. I see the family like that. That's the way I am now. <laughs> Hi. I am uh, the way that I am now, that's the way that I am at my job. I think I probably give a bit more than is required when my job is concerned because I proud of what I do and I do it to the best of my ability. They may know certain things about me, but there is a line I mean, as to how much they know because they are very deceiving people. They, they, um, they will bait you, 
pretend to be your friend to know what they know, what they want to know about you, and then um, the slightest thing you do, like for instance, you would say, oh, I, I allow them to know that I'm a member of Domestic Workers United, when I was like looking for a ways that they are telling them about overtime, and the first thing, they would quote a quote, they would tell us, say, okay, are you this, are you that, trying to find out certain things, immediately they take the turn, when you say to them, listen, this is what the law requires, immediately you see the difference, you see the horns come up, you know, the same people that were saying that you are family, and I made it quite clear, I am not your family, I am an employee, you are the employer. So, you know, as you go along, you see their traits, how quick they can switch, so you have to know how much you can let them know. But at the same time, I treat them with respect, and they kind of treat me with respect. You know, so that's it. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Gracia, for the most personal, heart-rending, gut-wrenching panel uh, I've ever heard. And thank you, Mark Noah, for even doing this. I would like to hear about the poverty stories or the reasons that you have to leave where you're from, what um, absence of work or opportunity in your home made you come here to seek something better? I am a mom and a grandmother. My younger son decided he wanted to come out here to school. Their father died about 10 years ago. I was a housewife all the time and, you know, having to work, didn't want to deplete all the money that I had at home. I said, you know what, let me come out here and I would work and it would be easier for him. Unfortunately, when I got here, he was in Florida when he actually was a swimmer for, for Trinidad and he was he took a year off from high school, not high school, when he was finished high school, he took a year off to decide what he wanted to do. And he was in a train camp in Florida. By the time I got here, he changed his mind and said he going back home because they offered him, you know, full scholarship back home and training and blah, blah, whatever. So I decided to say I'm here already. <laughs> he stayed two years when he was finished. He decided to go to Canada to do his bachelor's. He's there right now. And I mean, I left my other son and my granddaughter and my daughter in back home. And I think about, you know, returning home soon because, you know, it is really hard out here. So it's not that um, I did not have or I was on the bread line at home. I just thought it would have been wiser to spend U.S. money to keep him in the U.S. and to spend TT money to keep him in the U.S. So, that's it. Um, yes. Uh, I'm coming from a country where Mala, there's a country, uh, there's people from each country. So since that little, I always say, see all kind of people. So I always think when I'm grown, I, I would like to travel somewhere else the way they come here. So the first time I came here, I, I was a teenager. And I, I like it because of the system. Over there, uh, it's like we don't have a kind of benefit. You work, you have what you work for it. No social security, any kind of benefits. When you have 10 children, see your business, you decided to have it, you work for it to put together everything. And here, I think the first time, I always remember the first time I got here, after uh, I did something that I promised for the person I came to this country. I got a job, even it was, I remember they were paying me 180 for six days, a Jewish uh, family. So Friday, when it's uh, the Shabbat, I remember I started working, every day was up at 6 in the morning. But on Friday, we have to stay up until they finish their dinner to clean up because most of the dishes are uh, hand wash. And I remember I was fin we were finished at 2 in the morning. If we were finished at 2 in the morning, we have to be up at 6.30 because they have to go Saturday to the church. But you know, this family always treat me as a part of the house. So even though were, it's a hard job and a little money, I was happy, I was a teenager. So I saw the difference like, uh, I start doing like, if, if I come back after graduating, I will do this early amounts and I will do more money than my country in short time. And, that, and thanks to God, I was being a good people. But it's not like I'm not so good people, but it's okay because uh, I think I'm the most lucky domestic worker because I, I was working with a family that treated me nice. She appreciated my job. But I always see my friends being in a job, like paying 
sixty dollars for eleven hours, and they're not happy. Thank you. Let's just say this: it's not always poverty that drives people away. Whereas it might be, and because of globalization as well, um, in other countries, let's say Mexico or some parts of Latin America, um, it's it's not always poverty. Some people come on adventure, and and the world is a village. People are people are migrating every day, every day. They are in, in Tobago. Tobago, where, well, this is an island of Trinidad, which is Tobago. It's a prime golf course. And then our parents bring their lounge chair and live in Tobago like nobody's business. <laughs> their leisure, I tell you, up and down the coast. And from the time there's this pocket of migration, we talk about migration. I mean, people come seeking a better life, they go different places. I mean, for me, it was all about adventure. I came here with my daughter literally in my hip. She was five at the time. She's 27 now, living in Canada. I didn't come, you know, in abject poverty. But I came to be a part of the art world, the rich art world, too. But then you know what? I have to work, right? I'm not trying to be, be doing domestic work, tell you the truth. I really, you know, like somebody in one of my work, somebody look at me and say, wait a minute, I didn't know you used to do slave work. No. It's dignified work. I do it with all the work that I have. It was able to help me with my daughter through college too, but I came on an adventure. But per adventure, somebody else comes because of, of globalization, right? It ain't about a tennis ball in, in Mexico, right? The rural people are pushed out their land and they come seeking a life, right? And this will always happen, always, always happen. Don't, my, my father's family were educated abroad, b back in England, back in the United States. Every university imaginable. I came to do the same. I end up in the arts. I end up doing music. I end up doing poetry. I end up doing dance. I end up doing what I love, right? But to say, would I have done domestic work or it was abject poverty? No. But somebody else might speak to that. I think, oh, go ahead. no, I was going to say, I think that that's a really good question because oftentimes people see us as domestic workers. And that's all they see us as. They don't see us as human beings with families and with, with backgrounds. Like I spoke about Barbados, the beach, the sea, the sun. This is what I'm trading that for, you know? <laughs> and it's, it's a hard trade-off, I'll be very honest. And the longer I stay in this country, the more I realize that I miss home. And like many of us on the panel, it wasn't for a particular reason. But it's the adventure of life abroad. And like Christine said, because of globalization, um, because of the, the, the way that our countries have bartered and trade with these first world countries that has placed our countries in such depth, you know, we are here paying off that that we know will never be repaid. Um, but at the same time, we're performing a service and doing a job that has often been seen as unskilled and unskilled labor. And we do it with dignity, we do it with love, we do it with pride, and it's very reward rewarding work. Thank you. I think we have time maybe just for one more question, so if we could. Well, thank you so much. It's so inspiring to witness your writing community. And um, I'm struck by how much you share in common in terms of your politics and your intelligence and experience. I mean, even just listening to you right now talk about globalization, it's, it's wonderful. And um, some of you, you know, knew that you were poets, have been writing and involved in the arts for a long time. It sounds like some of you just discovered this. So I'm wondering what the future is of your writing workshop, because it is such an important group. And um, do you plan to keep sharing work with each other? Or um, just what are your future writing plans? Because it's, you know, especially for those of you who didn't even know that you were writers. Let me, let, me, let, me just, let, me, let me just say this. I think we should continue. Right. We all have a voice. People say that we don't, we, we don't have a That's not true. But it's, it's just enhancing that voice and pulling from that voice. What I've discovered with Domestic Workers United, and I'll speak true to power, everybody, their aunt and their uncle, comes in to DWU because we're so in vogue to write a story about Domestic Workers United. And half the time they go away, we never see these stories. What I would like to see come out of this group is our own little chapbook. Speaking truth to power. Because you have the New York Times, you have the Inquirer, you have the, the Burberry Black News, you have the Painters Review, and everybody else. And we never, ever, intonation, get to see these pieces of work. And it's about time that, I mean, that's an interesting question. And we do hope that Mr. Mark, who has been extremely <laughs> wonderful, will resume. And as I said before, we will have a part two. Because writing is such a healing, it's from such a healing place. After, after cleaning people's 
to feed all the dog and the babies behind and oh god the laundry list growing long 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 longer than the ladder Jacob so we need to write I, uh, you know, when we started this in January, we, um, we thought, well, we'll do this till May, and uh, we'll do this great pen event, and that'll be five months of creative writing. That's a lot of creative writing. And I think what we've discovered through this process is that we're only just at the beginning. And I want to thank all of these phenomenal individuals for taking the time every Saturday, for coming here today, as I always say, as I said at the beginning, as I said on the video, and as I'll end this now, I love hanging out with this group every single Saturday. <laughs>